Good evening. Welcome back to another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio and powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGit.com. That's TireGit.com. If you have to buy tires from somebody, you might as well buy them from us and help fund the movement, help support the movement. We believe in the freedom of movement, and that's exactly what the establishment wants to take from you now. I'm your host, Royce White, here in the belly of the beast, Minneapolis, Minnesota. This is episode 179. We crossed a million downloads. We've crossed a million views on YouTube. We know that the views are probably being throttled and skewed as well as the subscribers. And, and we take that with a grain of salt. What we, what we care about is that the people who actually do hear the conversation are moved by it, are inspired by it, are motivated by it, and, and find it valuable and appreciate it. Um, so congratulations to you, the audience. We've reached a million downloads on the audio platform, and that was uh, – uh, that that's a special feat, I guess. I'm not sure why. I mean, it really doesn't even matter how many people download the the podcast, if I'm being honest. What matters is that the podcast tells the truth, the truth that people need to hear. And today's going to be a rough one. I, um, I received some bad news that my friend, my childhood friend, Maurice Thomas, was uh, shot and killed over the weekend. I think this would have been uh, Sunday, early Sunday morning at around 2 a.m. And uh, hurts, definitely hurts. I mean, one of the, I said this on Twitter, but um, one of the tough parts about growing up is growing apart from people uh, that you had really... uh, really strong relationships with when you were young and, you know, not, not really realizing what those people meant to you until you receive tragic news that they're no longer here. And that might be one of the toughest parts about growing up. I guess I'm a little more emotional than usual because I, um, and my great aunt's funeral was last week as well. And, uh, she was probably the sweetest person you could ever meet. I mean, she really was. I don't know. I, I've, I've never heard anyone in my family or anyone I've ever met say a bad thing about my aunt, my aunt Rachel. She literally was the sweetest lady you could ever meet. A uh, little tiny, uh, you know, under five foot. You know, she was about four, four, seven, four, eight, something like that. I mean, it's just, just a tiny little sweet woman. And, uh, you know, being at her funeral and then seeing all of my family and just having the realization that there's so many people that it's it's almost impossible to 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 keep up with and and I just feel like as things have become more digital and more technological that we spend even less time together than we ever did. And it doesn't just go for family, but it goes for friends as well, childhood friends. I see people all the time that I haven't seen in a long a long time and and uh you know, I, I'm just one of those people who who cares about people and 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 I I care about what's going on in people's lives. I care about people's lives. That's why I'm running for office. That's that's why I want to represent people. Not just you know, my people, the people that I know, the people who I've met, the people I've come into contact with, but all people I really do. And I really understand how people have been lied to and how people have been manipulated and mistreated and misled and misrepresented. I really get it at a fundamental level. And I hope you all have come to believe that. I hope you have come to see that. But my friend Maurice um, was a friend at a time in my life when I had moved away from home and uh, I needed some brothers. I needed some brothers. I needed some people to look out for me. I needed some people to, to... to show me what it means to, to compete, to be a part of a team. And, and my, uh, my greatest memory from my friend Maurice, Maurice Thomas Jr., dead at 33 years old. My favorite memory was us being in seventh grade practice, basketball practice. And our coach, Leon, who was the, the father of another one of my friends, a friend, how I met Maurice was through my other friend, Jordan, uh, LaRoche, 
And, and, and God forbid if anything ever happened to him, I'd be in the same emotional uh, stupor that I am right now. Um, but my friend Jordan LaRoche's dad coached our AAU team. And I had started to come into my own in the seventh grade. My body had started to fill out. I had started to figure the game out uh, from an individual standpoint. I understood how to, how to take what I saw in my mind and the things that I wanted to have happen on the court, and I could make them happen. And that's a special time in a young a young man's life, but it also comes with a lot of dangers. And one of the dangers is you start to get full of yourself. And at seven, in seventh grade, I had that moment. I had that moment. I was going through puberty. I was, you know, I, I was kind of on my own. I had left home to some extent, and 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 the streets was kind of uh, raising me. And 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 I was figuring things out on my own at one of the most pivotal times in in my in, in anybody's life. And we were in basketball practice, and Maurice was a good basketball player, a great basketball player in, in, at that age. Uh, and and we, we actually all went to Cleveland Junior High together, which is on the east side of St. Paul. And um, we, had, we, we had a junior high league. This, this isn't so common anymore, especially nowadays. But back then, we had a city junior high league. So we played uh, for our city team during the week, our school team during the week, and then we played AAU on the weekends. Um, and in our city t league was pretty darn good because it's in the inner city, St. Paul. So, you know, all of the, the, the good inner city basketball players went to one of these junior highs. Well, you know, we went, you know, eight and one, lost one game. We went eight and one. We had a very, very good junior high team. And, uh, we were in practice one day for our AAU team and our coach made us run and I decided for whatever reason that day, I didn't want to run. I didn't think we should be running. I didn't think it was it was important. I was pissed off. I didn't think I should have to run. I don't necessarily remember exactly why I was, you know, uh, rebelling against having to run, but but I was. And then a lot of young players do. And Maurice pushed me. I remember he came behind me. We were running. We were doing the Indian-style run. I don't know if that's controversial or politically incorrect to say nowadays, but but they used to have a thing called the Indian run where, you know, you'd run in the line, and, and the guy at the back of the line had to get to the front of the line, and then the next guy at the back of the line had to get to the front of the line, and we were just going around the, uh, the gym. And so uh, I didn't want to run, so Maurice came from out of the line, back behind the line to push me, to physically push me, went out of his way, to run extra to push me to the front of the line. And uh, I, I took offense to that. I mean, I thought that he was trying to bully me. And that's, I remember f having that feeling like, eh, this kid, you know, he's, he's none of your business. And we ended up getting a little tussle and he blacked my eye, you know, punched me in the face, he blacked my eye. Uh, and, and, and receiving that news, I just, I just thought to myself how much I love him for having blacked my eye that day. I know that may sound strange, but he taught me a valuable lesson about being a part of a team. And he taught me a valuable lesson about being selfish, about thinking that the world revolves around me. The world didn't revolve around me. Even though I was having problems at home, even, even though, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you could look at my life at, at 13 years old and, and think to yourself, you've got it tough, you've got it bad, Even though I was going through a lot of, uh, you know, in, internal uh, problems, he taught me a valuable lesson that the world doesn't revolve around me, and especially when it comes to, to being on a team. And how dare I, how dare I make me so important that it would, it would, it would cost everybody else to have to continue to run. I love him to this day for that. One of, you know, a, a lesson that you don't even you don't even think about until you 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 get the news that your friend is dead. You don't even think about it, and it's funny because now I'm coaching all these young men from my son's age, seventh grade, all the way up to varsity. I'm still having conversations with college kids, and and hell, I still you know talk to many pro players, but but young men mostly. Uh, about the importance of, of, of sacrificing their own selfish way of thinking for the betterment of the team and, and how valuable that is, not only for them as basketball players, but for them as young men, for them as people in society. I mean, we just came off of losing um, 
a section playoff game. Uh, and in a dramatic fashion, we got beat pretty bad. And um, it's been the main message all year for our team. It's not about what's going on with you. It's not about what you want to do. It's not about what you think. It's not about how you look. It's not about how the game is going for you. It's about winning. It's about doing what it takes to win. Being a teammate that does the little things, that's committed, that's disciplined, that's on time, that puts in the work, that puts in the work so they don't have to fear the outcome because they know what they're capable of and what they're not capable of. It's about being that guy. And it's about inspiring other people to be that guy. And had Maurice not pushed me that day, had Maurice not blacked my eye and gave me that, that reality check about what it means to be on the team, maybe I don't make it. Maybe you don't know me. Maybe I'm not here today to fight for freedom and truth. Maybe I don't even make it. Maybe I fall victim to some of the same senseless violence that he did. And that's what hurts so bad. It really does, because I see it in that context. I mean, I see the totality of, of circumstance in that way and how close all of us are to that tragic end. Especially the needless violence. My friend Maurice was, was uh, the security guard for a parking lot there in Nashville, Tennessee. And, and allegedly um, two, two or three, a few uh, car robbers were robbing cars in the parking lot. And when Maurice encountered them, he was shot. He died later on at the hospital, later on that evening, at the, later on that night at the hospital. Hard to even describe the, 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 what I'm thinking right now. And I hate to make it political. I really do. But there's nothing more political than this. There really isn't. And it all sort of hits you at once when, when it hits that close to home and, and you really understand, uh, the, 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 again, the totality of circumstance. I don't want to make it political. But, but how can I not say it? How can I not say the quiet part out loud? No matter how you look at it, this establishment, look, the, the personal responsibility is on those three individuals. And yes, they're cowards. And I cannot believe how common, how common it is to, 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 to think that robbing people because you don't have enough money or you don't have enough of what, what, you, what you want. Not even what you need, but what you what you what you want. You don't have enough of what you want that you need to go rob people and not only rob people, but take another man's life. Now, there is a movement out here in this in this in this country. There is a movement called Black Lives Matter. There is a movement, a proto black movement. There is a movement that claims to care about black people. But we provide cover and excuses for young black men. And I don't know that these young men were black, but but. This sort of problem is typical in our community. We know it. I know it personally. So I don't need these posh liberal black folks to tell me otherwise. I know it personally. I came up in the neighborhood. I, I was in the streets at 13. I was in the streets on my own at 13. So I don't need any mealy mouth college educated black liberals to tell me what, the, what this country is about or what the black community is about because I've been there. I've been there and I know it. I know it personally. I don't know that these individuals were black, but if I'm being honest, as a young black man in this country, I would venture to guess that they probably were black. And that's not me being racist. Could they have been white just the same? Yeah, it's possible. Could they have been illegal immigrants just the same? Yeah, it's possible. Could they have been, it's possible. But typically we see this kind of thing, and, and let's take my friend out of it for a moment. I'll come back to that. But let's take him out of it. The very idea, see, and let's go to rap music, because rap, this whole thing is really uh, symptomatic of this culture 
what we call the culture. I remember I was watching again a second time. I got caught watching you people with with uh, Jonah Hill and and Lauren London, who was the uh, the, the the wife of. of uh, rapper Nipsey Hussle, who was shot and killed in a very similar situation by another black man, might I add, Eddie Murphy and, and some other, some other uh, you know, good, good actors and actresses. But anyway, the, the whole premise of the movie is kind of this, this friction between Jewish and black culture, uh, between the Jewish community and the black community. Jonah Hill represents the Jewish community and from a more traditional Jewish family that goes to synagogue and he meets this black girl and the black girl's dad is a, is a, is a, you know, a, a more of a, a a militant Muslim uh, man, and, and the mom is the mom is Nia Long, who's a you know famous Hollywood actress, black Hollywood actress. Uh, and anyway, there's this tension between the two cultures, and and it kept being referred to as the culture. And Jonah Hill, being Jewish, was very interested in the culture, that being hip hop culture, but not just hip hop culture, but really black culture, black American culture, and in that culture, it has become commonly accepted that robbing another black man or killing another black man in the pursuit of money is anything other than being a fucking sellout. If you are so in need of money, if you are so in need of material, if you are so in need of status or fame or, or how you look to somebody on social media or how you look to somebody in your own home or how you look to your boys in the neighborhood, if you are so, so invested in that, that you're willing to kill another black man, you can't claim to be for black people. And that is the sole place where this, this Black Lives Matter political scam and agenda becomes a house of cards because I don't care. I don't, I, I challenge any one of you out there, any one of you posh, mealy mouth, celebrity, A-list, public figure, black folks to step up in the, to, to the podium and tell me, tell me that we don't have a crisis in black communities pertaining to this issue. Leave everybody else out of it. The same way I would tell a young man on a basketball, don't tell me about the fucking refs. Don't tell me about the coaching. Don't tell me it's your teammates' fault. Don't, 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 don't tell me, you know, you, you didn't feel good today. I don't want to hear any of that shit. Now, there's a time and place to talk about some of those things. Don't get me wrong, because there are some shitty refs that make some shitty calls at some very, very uh, significant moments in a game. And there are some bad coaches that don't know what the hell they're doing. And there are some bad teammates, guys who are probably just as selfish as you are, if not worse. But the first thing a real leader always looks at is, what, what, what did I not do? That's the Kobe Bryant mentality. That's the Michael Jordan mentality. And I know both of them had great teammates that they, they played with that, you know, and a very good coach, the same coach, actually, Phil Jackson, for the two of them. But, but they had a great coach. So, so I get it. But the point is, they both had that mentality that if something goes wrong out there, what did I not do? We can get to the other stuff later, but the first thing I have to think of is what didn't I do? What, what, what didn't I do enough? That's that sense of individual responsibility and accountability. And it's a fine line. It's a very fine line. Don't, don't get me wrong. There's a fine line in here. And this is what makes it so difficult. Especially when you're talking about society and politics and culture. Because it's a fine, fine line. Because under no circumstances am I telling you that your individual responsibility should, should, should have you allowing institutions, governments, politicians, public figures, representatives to take advantage of you. That doesn't mean you can't acknowledge, understand, and acknowledge the, 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 the tyranny that's afoot in our country because that's what our whole movement is about. We are rightly identifying institutions, policies, legislation, mechanisms that have decayed the culture here in this country. That's what the America First movement is about. 
It's about putting Americans first and, and understanding all of the politics that don't put Americans first, that don't put my friend first. The flip side of that coin is we have to put us first, first. And we have to ask ourselves continuously, are we doing that? And it's not easy. It's not an easy answer. That's not, there's, there's, no, there's no magic pill. There's no quick solution, especially how far we've come now. So I'm not telling you that, that before, you, before you research, before you explore, before you start to look into the institutions that preside over you, that are destroying what it means to be free, that, that you have to look first at yourself. But I am telling you that. And what's funny about it is the two are the same answer. Because the people that govern over you, the institutions that have made it hard for you to live, harder for you to live, the institutions that have made you poor, the institutions that have made it hard for you to own a home, the institutions that have made it hard for you to own a business, a small business, the institutions that have made it hard for you to pay your taxes, the institutions are a reflection of you. They are a reflection of you. And that's tough. That's tough to hear. That's tough to swallow. But it's true nonetheless. And I know that's not the greatest political sales pitch. You know, it's always more advantageous. It's always more valuable. It's always catchier to blame somebody else. This is what Stalin did. This is what Mao did. This is what Hitler did. Hell, this is what our p politicians here do every single election cycle. It's them, it's them, it's them, it's them. No, it's, it's you, but it's me and you as well. Because they wouldn't be able to control and, and, and have the power they did if we didn't accept it. And I go back to the black community. Why? Because I look at Axios and I see them saying that non-white voters are leaving the, the, the Democrat Party. And then I go watch a, 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 a sit-down interview between Tucker and Chris Cuomo, which I got to say excites me. Uh, you know, as just as an onlooker, it excites me to see that people are having conversations that before they didn't have. And, and I hear Chris Cuomo say that that the that the um, that the key demographic, or maybe it was Tucker Carlson, I forget which one said it, but that the key demographic is not black voters. It's the unmarried woman. And so last week I had to have a conversation about the unmarried woman, but this week I have to go back to the black vote. And nothing strikes right at the heart of it than losing your friend who was murdered for no good reason. Murdered work in security in a parking lot, doing his job. I mean, there used to be sacred honor. If you're going to rob somebody, if you're going to rob a bank, you just don't go shooting innocent people. You don't just go shooting and killing innocent people. And I'm not making an excuse or, 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 or you, know, you know, trying to create some, some justification for crime. But there used to be a standard of sacred honor, even in the criminal world. Even in the criminal world. No women, no children. Remember that? No innocent people. And don't get me wrong. They, you know, they weren't the best at trying to uphold that ethic either. And that's part of the fall of, 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 of America's organized crime. You can read it right there. People said that they had values and beliefs and things that they stood for, a code of ethics. And when push came to shove, too many of them didn't have that, and it, and it crumbled from the inside. You think a country's any different? Do you think a country is any different? You think a nation and a government is any different? I said the other day on the up, and people didn't like this. You know, people get all squir squ squeamish. When your government steals, everybody steals. I went to three Republican conventions, Senate district conventions this weekend. Three of them all on the same morning. SD 42, 43, and 37. Now we're in the season where they're going to have conventions uh, to, to, to select delegates, and, and they let candidates come and, and speak about, about their candidacy. And I went to all three of them. Overwhelmingly white. No problem for me. I'm not scared of white people. I don't, I don't care what, what Rachel Maddow and Joy Ann Reed have to say. If I'm scared of any white folks, it's Rachel Maddow. It's Joe Biden. It's Bill Gates. I'm scared of them. I'm scared of Mark Zuckerberg buying a fucking, uh, you know, fallout bomb shelter in the mountains when the rest of us can barely can, can barely put together five hundred dollars cash in a crisis. I'm scared of them. I'm scared for myself. I'm scared what they'll do. I'm scared of Dr. Fauci 
if I'm going to be scared of white people, there's some white folks I'm afraid of. But in general, I'm not afraid of white folks. I'm certainly not afraid of these extreme Republicans they talk about. In fact, I'm more extreme than they are. And that's what you find out. You find out if you're willing to, if you're willing to, to, to have just a, 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 an ounce of backbone and courage and, and, and a, a testicular fortitude, that, that you can go to the places that they say you shouldn't go and you find out what's really going on there versus what they say is going on there. And what I found out, clear as, clear as rain, I'm more extreme than they are. Now, there was a lot of support in there as well, but I got the general sense that what I was saying was foreign. The, 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 the ideas were foreign, and this is an election about ideas. This is a referendum on ideas. What does it mean to be American? What does it mean to be free? What does it mean to be free? And I walked right into those Senate district conventions, and I told them from the start, yeah, we're real solid on two issues. The Fox News neocon conservatives are always going to be solid on the border and the debt. And they're shaky on the debt. Let's be honest. And the reason why they're shaky on the debt is because the third issue, the third elephant in the room that they're unwilling to talk about and they get real shaky on is the military industrial complex. And you can't talk about the debt without talking about the military industrial complex. These neocon, these, these, these boomer con, rhino, 501c3 Christian rhinos have convinced themselves that the social programs are the only, the only deficit spending that we need to be concerned about. And yes, a lot of these social programs are nothing more uh, than, than an, uh, 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 a nationwide effort, a cultural wide effort to keep people dependent on the government. Dependency and freedom are antithetical. They're opposite. They don't go together. You can't be free and dependent. And this is the problem with many, many of these men. This is why I talked about the Me Too movement last week and this cuckold problem that we have in this country. As soon as you're so dependent on a woman that she'll let her treat you anyway, you're no longer free. All you men out there, you better understand that. Don't talk to me about being a patriot or, or being free or, or, or being a 760, 7, 1776 or any of this other shit. As soon as, you, as soon as you're so dependent on a woman that you let her mistreat you, you become a slave to her emotional and psychological whims. You are no longer free. And that's not a tangent. It, 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 it's correlated. And I walked right into those conventions, and, and there's a lot of women in there. But, it, but, but the, the reality is, is there's a lot of, of, of boomers, boomers in there, and that's fine. You know, they call me the boomer whisperer. Everybody who's around me who's met me, they know that I, 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 I spend more time with older people. And many say it's because I'm an older soul. I think like an older person. I'm inquisitive. I'm, I'm, I'm more, you know, I, I'm, I'm just insightful in that way. I don't know what it is. Probably because I had to grow up so early from being in the streets at 13. You got to grow up quick. You got to figure it out quick or you die. And I had a lot of friends that didn't make it. Haven't lost one in a long time. That's why Maurice dying hit so hard. But I was in these SD conventions and I told them that the Republicans are very solid on the border and the debt. At least the debt they'll talk about. But they'll be silent on this military industrial complex issue. I mean, and as a whole issue, I'm not even picking out the Ukraine. I'm talking about as a whole issue, the entirety of the military industrial complex and how it functions. They're silent on that one. The three are inextricably linked. Don't, don't tell me, you, look, a border works in both directions. And we got to start, we got to clarify that. We got to understand that. Because this is this is the contradiction that's being used to wage a, a, an anti-American narrative, an anti-colonial narrative all around the world. And it's partially accurate. You see Africa now, the, the, the country there, Niger, has has uh, terminated its, uh, its its military agreement with the United States or with NATO or with whichever one. It was the same thing. It's terminated its agreement. 
Why? Because there is a narrative. There's a narrative out there brewing. America wants it. One, They want their cake and they want to eat it too. But not all of us do. Not all of us do and not all of us think that way. Not all of us do. Not all of us think that way. We don't have to have our cake and eat it too. Borders work in both directions. It's very hard. It's very difficult to maintain a border here while you tell everybody else in the world they have to accept that, that, that there are no borders for them, that you can come and go as you please because you got the biggest guns or you got the most money. And if you guys don't want us there, then, then we'll do it covertly. We'll do it classified. We'll do it in secret. We'll do it in the shadows. That undermines our border here. It really, and if you don't see it that way, you're a neocon, and we don't need you. If you don't think how the CIA operates in the shadow around the world undermines the integrity of our sovereignty here in America, then you're not seeing the long game. The long game is these countries are going to get wise to it. They're not going to be stupid forever. And when they do, they're, they're going to they're gonna rally around this collective sentiment that, that the rules are for thee and not for me. The rules are for, for, for thee and not for we. And, and that sort of self-centeredness, that sort of self-centeredness is up and down. It's, it's a rot in our, in, our, in our culture. There is a cultural rot. The rules-based order, the rules aren't the same for everybody. Who are you guys kidding? And I told everyone in there, listen. D does this benefit you? Do these forever wars benefit you? Fox News, Fox News will show you young black men stealing from a from a department store at the drop of a dime. But then they'll punt when it's time to stand up for your rights to have fair elections, secure elections. Then they punt. When it's time for that, when it's time, when the rubber meets the road on the fundamentals of being American and being a citizen, they punt. But they'll fear porn and monger you to death. It's obnoxious. And I just had a friend that was killed by car robbers. But I still understand the, the, the bigger picture. The bigger picture is I could get all the black, young black men to, in the entire country together and add up everything that they've stolen misappropriated, robbed, tooken. It wouldn't be one one millionth of a fraction of what this government takes from you every day. And that's what you conservatives got to get clear about. Now back to my friend and the rot in the black community because, see, when your government steals, everybody steals. And that's not to say the government is responsible for what happened to my friend, but it is to say that if I'm in a room, with, it's the reason why we have, uh, you know, parental advisories on, 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 uh, you know, uh, you know, music albums. It's the reason why we have FCC. It's the reason why we don't, we don't, we don't let just anybody teach our children, or we used to not anyway. Now, getting a little wishy-washy on that, but there's a reason why. We try and put constraints around what people are able to do when it comes to influencing other people. It's part of the reason why we don't let young women uh, engage in, in consensual sexual relations with men who are much older than them. Because we, we recognize that there's a, there's a sort of a psychological disadvantage that takes place and that it can, it can impact to the level where it no longer can be seen as, as her fault or her being able to consent to what she's actually doing. Now, there are a lot of people who would argue that point. And fine, you can have that argument, but, but we know what good, decent people know what I'm saying. You know, you're 50 years old, you're, you're, you're having sex with a 15-year-old girl. It's not right. It's not right. And that, that has evolved from our society. Back in the, in the days of the, the British Empire and the Anglican Church and the monarchy used to happen all the time. We've evolved. So some things have gotten better. Some things I agree with. Not everything that's come out is all bad. But there are some things that we have not yet dealt with. And part of it is, part of it is the government has become so big 
The establishment has become so big, it's global. Its reach is, is almost incalculable. Its reach is unlimited. And it's so big that the culture, the culture that it creates is a rot. When your government steals, everybody's stealing. It doesn't excuse anybody involved. It doesn't excuse the, 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 the people who shot my friend. They're cowards. They're cowards. They're, 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 they're selfish. And they will be caught. You know, God, God, God willing, they will be caught and they should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Give them all life. Shooting innocent people for no reason. Now, I can see if two people come together face to face and both of them have a gun and, 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 and self-defense. I get that. And that happens a lot. And it happens a lot in the black community. That goes unspoken about. And we got to sort that out, too, at some point. But, but uh, you know, briefly, I'll just say, a lot of people out there with guns, you come face to face with somebody with a gun or you're afraid somebody else has a gun, he's known to have a gun. And, and so you get nervous or scared or scared for your life or, or maybe this person threatened you before, or whatever the case may be. And, and you know, you, you don't know what he's going to do. You're not waiting for him to reach into his pants or whatever the case may be. And, you know, that happens every day in this country, too in the black community. So that's a different deal. But you go to a parking lot and you're going through cars at the parking lot and the parking lot security guard comes to encounter you, comes to, 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 to stop you or to, to apprehend you or whatever the case may be, and you shoot and kill him just doing his job because you don't have enough money or, or whatever it is you think you need, completely self-centered, completely and utterly disgraceful. Not to mention the, the level of sin that it is, which it, it is a grave, grave sin, that, that type of act. So not only are you killing and murdering somebody, it's completely unjustified. No quantifiable justification can even be derived from it. And back to my point, back to my point from before. All you people out here saying Black Lives Matter, say his name, say his name. Say his, say, say Maurice Thomas Jr.'s name. Say his name. And there's a difference between when citizens kill citizens and when cops or, or, or government agencies kill citizens because the distribution of power is obviously different. But you better have the same type of fucking enthusiasm for what we're doing to ourselves in these communities as you do trying to run this race propaganda. I was pulled over the other night, and you guys know I don't shill for no police. One of the most dangerous, and if you, if you want to get, I'll save that for a moment. But I was, uh, you know, I don't shill for the police. I'm not mentioning no words about police and, and, and how awful police can be. In fact, I just did a podcast three weeks ago talking about that very issue. But all of it needs to be discussed, honestly, truthfully, objectively. I was with a friend, uh, you know, a friend this weekend, and, and, and my friend and his wife at their anniversary, and we had gone out to dinner, and we were on our way back home from dinner, um, and, and we were pulled over by a cop right there on highway, right there on 169. Anybody who's from Minnesota, they know 169. He's familiar, runs north and south. Pulled over. And, yeah, you get that, you know, I'd be lying if I said as a young black man who's actually been in a situation where I was mistakenly identified and had seven cops pull their guns on me and could have easily killed me had I made the wrong move. When the cops get behind me, yeah, I'm a little nervous. Honestly, and I, and I think rightfully so, because I've seen the incompetence, the level of incompetence when a government gets too big. And institutions lose that, that sense of... of of, uh, of righteousness. So yeah, I was a little nervous. But the cop came right up to the window, rolled it down. He said, hey, I just want to tell you that your lights are off. You got no lights on. The valet at the restaurant we were at had obviously turned off the automatic lights, didn't know what they were doing. But before we left, 
We didn't think to turn them on because it's supposed to be automatic. Small mishap. We didn't we didn't get mad at the cop. We 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 didn't talk back to him. And why the fuck are you pulling me over or anything? Just oh, okay, yeah, then thanks, man. Yeah, we didn't didn't realize. Now he asked, have you been drinking? We we hadn't been drinking, so that was that was that. Let us go on about our way. Hey man, have a good night. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you, man. We we really didn't know that the lights were off. That's that's wild. So I'm not getting down on the cops and I'm not shilling for the cops. But my point is you better have the same type of energy for what's going on in our communities, the violence that we're perpetrating against each other as you do in running this race, anti-cop, cop versus civilian, black versus white propaganda. And every time we don't, we undermine our own community. We undermine our own vote. We undermine our own political acumen. We undermine the value of our citizenship, the citizenship that Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and all these political figures, these icons in history that, that we hold up, that we place on a pedestal, that we revere, that we celebrate. All those people fought for you to be recognized as a citizen under the full extent of the law. But when you start a collect, when you start a cultural movement that says that we're we're going to play fast and loose with the truth, we're going to acknowledge a thing here, but not over there. You undermine, you undermine yourself, and that's really the biggest issue. You undermine yourself. Ain't about anybody else. You undermine you as an individual. And so, say my friend's name. Who who's going to rally? Who's going to protest for this? Nobody. Nobody's going to say a thing. None of these politicians are going to say a thing. They don't say a thing. Oh, another tragic day in the neighborhood. Another tragic day at the office. Black man killed by some other black man. Oh, that's real, real terrible. So sad, so senseless. So calculated. And let, let's get to that part, see. That's the part that really, that's the part that really infuriates me. When I'm done being sad that, that my friend is no longer here, I'm infuriated because I know that that despite what what anybody out there may think about politics and, and, and political parties or political agendas or narratives or so on and so forth, I know what the legislation is meant to do. <clears throat> Isn't that the whole the whole the whole new movement of blacks that are fleeing the Democrat Party? is because they're letting illegal immigrants into the country and giving them money. They're giving them the tools and the resources to get on their feet and be successful. They're giving them a leg up on American citizens. Black, white, yellow, or green. But the black community in particular is starting to flee the Democrat Party because they find it particularly offensive. That's happening. That's happening right now. There are a lot of people that still just don't get it. And, oh, they'll talk about, oh, well, well, people are stealing and robbing because they're poor. Who do you think made you poor? Who do you think's keeping you poor? Oh, people are robbing and stealing because, the you know, mental health is, is an issue. And, and who do you think has inflated the cost of, of, of medical services and, 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 uh, and, and, and medicine? Oh well, it's the guns. The guns are an issue. Who do you think made? Who do you think made it so? So most of the people who who are victims of of violent crimes or or, or gun crimes didn't have guns themselves. Who do you think has strategically, strategically uh, stripped the American culture of its of its uh, sense of of uh, uh, independence, self sufficiency when it comes to our own security, our personal well being. Our physical boundaries, our physical sovereignty as individual citizens. Who do you think has done that? Republicans? Well, in actuality, you're right. Republicans have been involved in that. And guess what? The movement that I'm a part of, the movement that I'm leading, the movement that I'm speaking for, we denounce those Republicans. We call them Democrats. And we call them Democrats for that very reason. I can't tell you how many people I heard stand up at these conventions and talk about security 
national security, national security, which is a dog whistle for the military industrial complex. That's what it is. National security, national security. The best form of national security is a 450 million person populace strapped to the teeth, armed to the teeth. That's the best form of national security. Don't get me wrong. We need some jets and some aircraft carriers and some things like that. They don't need to be stationed all over the world. We don't need to be in Niger. Niger wants to get out of the deal. Good. Let Niger be. Let Niger defend itself. Let Niger make a deal with the Chinese, with the CCP. Let, let, let Niger, okay, come under the thumb of the country that put Muslims in concentration camps. Okay, Niger, big bad Niger, go out there on, 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 the, on the plank. Go ahead and walk the plank. We don't have to stick around to be a part of it. We don't have to be party to it. We don't have to watch it. You go walk the plank. You, you tell us how long it is before the CCP has strong-armed you into, into being a part of their, their bigger political agenda. Think the, think the Chinese, think the CCP are friendly to, to people of color, to people with dark skin? Are you people stupid? No, you're not stupid. You're in on it. You're in on it, and you're thinking short term. And that's a real indictment of you. But don't think I'm going to do it. Don't think I'm going to sit here and let you black folks talk all this pro-black, the white man, bad white supremacy, the system is set up to be. I'm from the neighborhood. I know how shiftless you Negroes are. I know how selfish you Negroes are. I know how much drugs you Negroes do. I know how unwilling you Negroes are to speak the truth. See, because if you're willing to take money, just think about it. You know, the white supremacy, white supremacy. But you want to spend that money. You want to steal that money and spend that money. And, and what's crazy about it is you most of the time you're going to spend that money with some white folks, with some white people. You're going to buy Hermes. You're going to buy Gucci. You're going to buy Italian Finocchios. Italian Finocchios who you don't even live the same lifestyle with. They live a posh, metropolitan, global, omnisexual, freaky-ass lifestyle. Y'all ain't even got nothing in common with these people wearing Gucci and Hermes and all this other bullshit. This is what I'm wearing right here, warm. warm so warm. The temperature dropped back here in Minnesota again. We, we get another taste of, of that Minnesota winter, 27, 28 degrees. I'm warm. What do I need Hermes for? Gucci. It's embarrassing. I, I'm embarrassed to be seen with Gucci on. Back when I was younger and I first got to the league, I bought a, bought a couple pair of Ferragamo loafers. I won't even wear them now. I won't even be seen with them on. What do I look like being seen with some, some $750 leather loafers on? I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed I was stupid enough to think that that was important to buy. But some of y'all are still caught up and you're neck deep in the shit. And it's pervasive. It's corrosive. That's what I'm trying to get at. You know, and you got these rappers, you know, it's buying these chains and showing up with these stacks of money and, and we're going to shoot each other for some beef because, because you said something. I mean, give me a break. And y'all want me to believe that y'all care about black people? And you white liberal institutions from the mainstream media in Hollywood that help promote that sick ass mindset want me to believe that you are defending democracy so black people have a fair chance in this country. Fuck you, people. You're full of shit and we're coming. And that's what you're going to have to kill every last one of us. And I mean that shit. You're going to have to kill every lad. There's not a fucking thing that could happen in this country that would ever make me turn back to that sleep, brainwashed way of thinking that you white liberals have promoted and, 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 and promulgated and pushed through the black community. There's not a thing that could happen. Donald Trump could get up on stage, pull his pants down, take a shit up at the podium, and I still would never vote for you fucking Democrats again. Let that sink in. And it's not, it's not a love or, or, or an obsession with Donald Trump. It's you. 
You people, your lies, your bullshit is the reason why I would never participate in the scam again. And it's also because of the ideas, the ideas of freedom, the ideas of having a country, the ideas of having independence and an individual sufficiency. These ideas are universal. I don't care about the propaganda. I don't care what some fucking rapper says. Why would I care what some fucking rapper has to say about politics? Point one out. Point honestly. Show me one. I'm I'm not I am not kidding. Show me one rapper I should listen to. It's what Malcolm X said back in the day about the Civil Rights Act, about the meeting with 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 Johnson, with Lyndon B. Johnson. Harry Belafonte, Lena Horne, all of these actors and actresses. Show me where in the in, what do they, what do y'all know about politics? If anything, y'all have shown that y'all are willing to sell out. And a lot of you black folks out here have shown you're willing to sell out. And I'm not trying to bang on black folks, you know, because my friend is dead. But, but I just ask myself, who's going to protest this? Where's the protest going to be? For? I could call a protest tomorrow. Uh, you know, stop the black on black crime. And it ain't going to get one tenth of the support from the white liberals or the LGBTQ community that, that, that some police killing would get. You think that's by accident? It's not by accident. It's not by accident at all. It's exactly how they want it to be. It's exactly how they intended it to be. It's exactly how they, it's exactly how they designed it. Designed it for y'all to run around in a rat maze. And you think you got power. You think you got juice. You think you got juice? Because some other poor Negroes will follow you around and be self-destructive? You think that makes you special? You think that makes you a boss? You think that makes you a gangster? That's just not gangster. That's just not cool. It's like Bumpy Johnson says, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's like Richard Pryor said back in, the, back in the day in the movie Harlem Nights. Again, the reference. Such an such a incredible movie with, with a lot of wisdom. And despite what you think about Richard Pryor and being on drugs and, and, you know, it's the same thing about Donald Trump. You don't have to like everybody, but you take the wisdom from people. And when they're right, they're right. And Eddie Murphy and, you know, the Red Fox, it was just a great movie. It's a black classic. A far cry from the shit we get today. And they want to tell you, well, the times have just changed. No, the standards have fucking changed. The culture has changed. The culture has changed. For the worse. Richard Pryor told Eddie Murphy, you know, okay, you want to be a tough guy. You know, you want to shoot your way to the top. That's that's fine. That's cool. What's what's your headstone going to read? Here lies a man 27 years old, but he didn't take no shit. That's not cool. He said being 80 years old with your grandparents, with your, with your grandkids around. Uh, you know, at the at the bed, your your children and your grandchildren and, and your family and your love. And this is your legacy. This is your legacy. I got four kids. I want four more. I want I want six more. I, I'll take 10 more. And to be able to see them grow up right now at 32. If I have another four, if I have another four or five kids right now from here to 40, I got a good chance of living to be 60, 65, hopefully, and to see all of them have kids. It don't get no better than that. And anybody who tells you different is anti-human. All these Democrat, liberal, finocchio, omnisexual fucks who will tell you that it's it's a net negative on the climate in the world to have children. These are the people who you're following. And just because the rap music in your ears, the gangster music in your ears has you so distracted that you don't realize that's who you're following, it's still who you're following. The Victoria Newlands and and these 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 other weird white women who wear African pendants on their neck at at international summits that you're not invited to, mind you. Now they get to speak on behalf of you, and you ain't invited. You can't go to Davos, Switzerland. You can't go to Geneva. You can't go to Brussels. You can't even afford to get there. But they represent you. Okay. Okay. 
and you let these people tell you they rep- that, that, that they're fighting for you? And you're running around shooting each other? Oh, beef is beef, you know? Kill or be killed. Y'all ain't even fighting over nothing serious. Let's be honest. I mean, let's be honest. Let, let's talk about it. Let, let's talk about the real. Fentanyl, there's another example, another good example. You know, you're so high, you're so dependent on drugs that, that you got to rob somebody in order to, in order to, uh, uh, in order to feed your habit. And I don't even just mean drugs. I mean the high of distraction from being a good person with meaning in your life and sacred honor. You're getting high. You're getting high as a distraction. And that ain't just fitting on drugs. That could be women. That could be the adoration and adulation you get from going to the club. Or that could be uh, the, the clothes you buy or social media. Now they've made the narcissism baked into the game. So everybody's the star character in their own movie. And, and the, the high that you get from, from getting points, likes, or whatever it is from being that star character, now you're willing to go kill somebody over it? <coughs> and I get it. Some of you are degenerate. Some of you don't have any sacred honor. Some of you have no real code of ethics. I get it. I understand that. But what I'm saying to you is don't be talking about black people and white people. Don't let me catch you on the internet talking about white people this and white people that, making excuses for white for black folks because white people did this and did that. You don't even know what they're teaching up at your kid's school. Let's talk. Let's talk about it. I'm, I'm pissed off now. Now you don't fucking piss me off. Let's talk about the real. You don't even know what they're teaching up at your kid's school. They up there teaching your, your sons to cut their penises off and kill your legacy and bloodline. You don't even know about it. You still letting them go. You ain't even on the, t- the, the, the email. You ain't on the email. You, you, you ain't getting notifications. See, mine, they all know. The, all, all of them know. All my kids' mothers know. You, ain't, no, ain't no GSA class. Ain't no gender, sexuality, gay, straight alliance for my kids. Opt them out. Opt them out. That's not the last stand. That's not the last frontier. That's that's not the last battle right there. But that is one step to taking back the ability to even talk about what somebody else is doing. I'm watching it. I don't even know where your kids are. A lot of people don't even know where their kids are at. <clears throat> and I get it. Don't, don't get me wrong. I get it. Times are hard. Things are difficult. The economy is bad. Opportunity is low. But who do you think did it to you? You're letting people tell you they love you that are proven to you they don't love you. They're proving it with their actions. They don't love you. They're just telling you they love you. Don't let people who are telling you blatantly, we don't love you, to pretend that they love you. They're not even doing a good job of lying. I can see if they were doing a good job. If the Democrats were actually responsible for you getting some money or you getting some opportunity. Or for you having some more control of your own life. You having some more sovereignty, some more freedom as a black person in this country. You're not getting that. They're killing us. They're killing us with the food. They're killing us with the policies. They're killing us with the medicine. They're killing us with the culture. They're killing us with the education. They're killing us. You think it's a you think it's a benefit to you? You think it's good for you? When they let your kids pass through a grade and they haven't reached the requirements to, to go to the next level, you think that's a, you think that's a, it's like, it's, it's, it's like putting the Jews in the middle of all their enemies. That's a sign of love. Are you kidding me? There's not a thing you Democrats could say or do that would ever let me, ever let me play that game ever again. 
buy into that game, buy into that bullshit. Like I said before, Donald J. Trump could come out to his next rally, pull his pants down, squat down, take a shit in the middle of the stage, and I still wouldn't vote for Joe Biden or Kamala Harris or Michelle Obama or whatever other self-righteous fucking liberal omnisexual scam artists y'all pull out of the, off of the bench. Not a chance because I know too much. Because I know that you can't talk to me about the price of bread. You can't talk to me about the price of bread. <laughs> the price of bread for a young single mother. And you're inflating the economy every time you pass a continued resolution. Now, most black folks in the country may not understand what a continued resolution bill is and what it does. And I know, I know for a fact that they don't. Because, again, I'm from the neighborhood. I didn't, I didn't grow up in the suburbs. I didn't grow. I, I wasn't adopted to some white family like Colin Kaepernick. I know I, I've been around black folks all my life. I, I'm still around black folks every single day. So this, this, ain't no, this ain't no theory. I know that most black folks in this country have no idea what a continued resolution bill. And the reason I, most white folks don't know what a continued resolution bill is, to be honest. Most people don't know how their government's stealing from them. Got a bunch of opinions, though. Ready for the race war. Let's talk black, white. While they steal the fucking green from you. We don't know what a continued resolution bill is in our community, but what it is doing undoubtedly is creating an inflationary economy. And every, I, had, I had a family member tell me that about the minimum wages. Minimum wage? I mean, that's how, that's how shallow we've gotten with this shit. That's that's how shallow our political understanding is. I'm not getting down on the person. I love is my cousins. One of my, I mean, it's blood. I love I love her. But she has no clue what's going on in this country. And it's not even her fault. This is by design. It's by design that most people have no clue how this country, how government, and how the economy functions. It's by design. They like it that way. They're gonna tell you Trump is a racist and a rapist. Don't look over here at the young black men who are killing another black man who's just working his job doing security. Don't think about that. Don't think about the money we're stealing from you because that's above your pay grade. You know, you wouldn't understand it if we explained it to you. Well, guess I actually understand it. And what's on what's what's crazy is they're not really they're not really hiding it. They're not really keeping it a secret, which really tells you what they think about how stupid you are. And they really do think you're stupid. And that alone should keep you from voting for them. But I know it won't because, you know, we got that sort of sadomasochistic thing going on in our in our community. We we like to be spit on and pissed on and told that it's rain, told that it's champagne, something something about it. We like being we like the degradation of 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 an insult in our intelligence. Something must be going on because they're not hiding. it. They're telling you. We're going to inflate the fucking economy. That's what we're going to do. We're going to make all the goods cost more. When we go to war and we print money that we don't have, the price of your goods are going to go up. Unless we're going to steal natural resources from somebody else that will make the price of your goods go down, which in turn is usually us oppressing some other group that you say you're fighting for the freedom of. You understand that? Do you, do you get that? Do you get that the only time we go to war and it's a positive on the economy is when we go to take somebody else's shit. And so ipso facto, again, you're benefiting off of off of a government that you say is is full of white supremacy, pirating somebody else's natural resources. And then you talk about the white man's bad. But you got your feet up enjoying the Netflix on your brand new smart TV and they done pulled the cobalt from the Congo. What kind of delusion are you? What what kind of are you telling yourself? They're going to inflate the economy. They're inflating the economy. And they're going to talk to you about minimum wage. No, we don't need minimum wage. We need to make things in this country, which we can do, that would drop the cost of the things that we buy. You think that the, the rise of the cost of goods is, is happenstance, it's accidental? It's not accidental how much shit costs in this country. 
It costs that much because we've outsourced it. We've outsourced it. That's why it costs so much. They want to tell you, oh, Americans want so much money. Americans want too much money. The unions did it. Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters, they pushed too hard on the corporations, and, and that's what made all the corporations flee for cheap labor back in the 70s. and what Bullshit. Bullshit. The, the Federal Reserve was going to work on inflating the dollar well before Jimmy Hoffa ever drew his first breath. This is by design. Poverty by design. They've turned the American people into serfs. And you think they give us, you think they're giving a special, a special consideration for the black folks who are victim to the same process? They love to see you shoot each other. That's why I marched you Negroes to the Federal Reserve when George Floyd died. They love to see you Negroes kill each other over money. Fake money. They love to see you Negroes murder each other over money. And you oblige. Rest in peace to my good friend Maurice Thomas Jr. I love you, brother. I'm, I'm so sorry. To your family. Sorry I wasn't there. I love you. You meant a lot to me. More than you know. More than you knew. More than I made the time to tell you. And you know, we work on what we work on. I spend my time doing this. And it's a battle. It's a battle. It's a battle to know that, that when push comes to shove, we only have so much time in this world. And that the time that I spend trying to, trying to get across tough truths and, and, and information that I think people need to know is taking time away from somebody like a Maurice that I, I should do better to find the time just to, just to say, I love you, man. And I, and I appreciate everything you meant to me before it's too late. But we're in a crisis. We are in a crisis. We're in a, we are in a war. We're in a war in our communities. We're in a war inside our families. We're in a war internally in our own mind. We're in a war in this country. And in wars, we lose people. And it's sad. It really is. I'm hurt. I really am. Another great person. Hilarious, smiles, funny. Could always make you laugh. Was a good person, too. There's one thing I remember about Maurice. He was a good person. He understood what, what was right and what was wrong. Even at a young age, he had that sense of, 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 what was right and what was wrong. He was raised the right way. And I'm not even saying he was raised the right way because I'm not even, you know, you have friends when you're young and you come up in the community like I did. I don't even really know what his, what his family life was like. I only remember ever even meeting his parents a few times, to be honest. Now, they might have been great parents or maybe they weren't there. I don't really know. I can't speak to that. I'm sure he had parents and, and my prayers and thoughts are with him. I'm just saying I never really, that wasn't our relationship. We played sports together. We hung out together at another friend's house. And, and that friend's father was, was gracious enough to take all of the boys in who, who didn't necessarily have a stable place to be like myself, the same way I'm willing to do for the kids that play on my team, to try and help teach them and cover them and, and ensure that they don't end up the victim the same way Maurice did. And even worse on their soul, the, the people who did it. Because it's one thing to be shot and killed, and that's tragic. But I, 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 I saddened for the souls of the people who did it.
That's the country we built, though. That's where we live. That's where we live. That's what we've done. That's how we want it. The convenience of, of the convenience of what we've built, the high of what we built, the feeling it gives us is is so important. That's how we want it. We're okay with it being this way. If we weren't, it wouldn't be. So it is on us. Now I feel a sense of responsibility. I feel a sense of responsibility that this this iPhone that I have has made it so convenient to to so convenient to distract myself and detach from reality. There's a price. It hits a little close to home today when they when 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 you say the price of freedom is death. Maurice, I love you. Um, my my thoughts and prayers are with his family. Uh, told myself I wasn't gonna cry up here. I mean, I know how cliche it is for uh, for a person to get up on a podcast and start crying, but. It really is. It, it really is that tragic. So much life ahead of him. Same age as me. And look, it could be me tomorrow. And it could be you. And it could be somebody you love. And it's been somebody you loved. And, and I understand. I'm not the first person to lose somebody. And in this moment, I think to myself sometimes, who are you to cry? Who are you to be so sad and, and, and you know, and, and, and distraught about it? There's people who have lost way more people than you in much more tragic ways. I think about the the, the, the great uh, Clarence Avon and, and, and his story about some young men, you know, running in his house there in Hollywood Hills and, and shooting and killing his wife. People have had their kids shot by stray bullets. I mean, this is the this is the country we've created. And this week it hits home for me. Um, it's been another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio and powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGate.com. Um, you want to help the movement, you want to support the movement, go to FreePeopleRadio.com and uh, find out more about the podcast, where you can watch and listen. You can visit our store. Uh, got some great, great stuff on there for you. Um, and to end, I just want to have a moment of silence for my friend, Maurice Thomas. The fight continues, and as always, Godspeed.